Dr. Judith S. Weiss is a professor emerita of biological sciences at Rutgers University, Newark. She received her bachelor's degree from Cornell and MS and PhD from NYU. Her research focuses on estuarine ecology and ecotoxicology, and she has published over 200 refereed science, scientific papers, as well as books on salt marshes, salt marshes, a natural and unnatural history, fish, do fish sleep, crabs, walking sideways, the remarkable world of crabs, and marine pollution, marine pollution, what everyone needs to know. These were published for the general public and co-edited, uh, and she co-edited a more technical book on biological invasions and animal behavior. She is interested in stresses in estuaries and their effects on organisms, populations, and communities. Much of Judith's research has been in the NY and New Jersey harbor area, but she has also done research in Indonesia and Madagascar. She's on the editorial board for Bioscience, is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and was a Fulbright Senior Specialist in Indonesia. She has been on advisory committees for USIPA, NOAA, and the NAS, and currently chairs the Science Advisory Board of NJDEP, co-chairs the Science and Technical Advisory Committee for the New York, New Jersey, Harbor Estuary, and serves on the Waterfront Management Advisory Board of New York City. She chaired the biology section of AAAS, served on the board of CTAC, the Association for Women in Sciences, and the American Institute of Biological Sciences, of which she was the president in 2001. She received the Merit Award from the Society of Wetland Scientists in 2016. Please welcome Judith Weiss. Hello, uh, I'm Judith Weiss, and I'm happy to present to you a talk uh, on Walking Sideways, The Remarkable World of Crabs, which is a book that I wrote some years ago. Uh, and it's just a general discussion about all things about crabs. So let's get started. Uh, starting with the very basics, what is a crab? A crab is a crustacean, and it's in a group called decapods, which means 10 legs. Uh, and it shares this group with lobsters and shrimp. The thing that is unique about crabs is that their abdomen or tail isn't sticking out behind, but is tucked underneath. As you can see from this underneath view of a crab, uh, the tail is not sticking out, it is tucked underneath. Uh, the basic anatomy here in this particular example, we see there's a claw or chela, followed by one, two, three, four walking legs. So with five appendages on each side, that means 10. Um, this particular example, though you see the last leg is a flattened paddle, it's a swimming paddle. This is a group of crabs, including the blue crab, that are uh, that can swim well because of this last uh, leg as a paddle. Uh, looking on the underneath, you can see this individual has a very wide abdomen and this one is narrow. That's how you can tell a female from a male. Uh, female has a very broad uh, one and male is less. Uh, the next is the uh, anomura, which are less there are fewer of them than there are of the brachiura, which are called the true crabs. The anomurans comprise of hermit crabs, mole crabs, king crabs, and porcelain crabs. The tail is not tucked quite so much underneath. You can see this in, in, in this example of a hermit crab. The abdomen is curved around, but not flatly tucked on the bottom. And this enables uh, your hermit crab to live inside a snail shell. Uh, other examples of anomurans are these mole crabs, uh, which uh, are very common near the area on an ocean beach where the waves wash up. 
Uh, and then the very largest representatives are king crabs, shown here, very large, a very important commercial fishery in Alaska, and then porcelain crabs, which are much smaller. These are very common on the Atlantic coast beaches. They're called horseshoe crabs, but they're not really crabs at all. They have been around a very long time. They are living fossils, quote, quote, um, and their eggs are very important for migrating shorebirds, but they're not a crab at all, and we will not be talking any more about them today. Looking back at, at crabs, they live in all sorts of different places. Uh, we commonly associate them with the marine environment, and in the marine environment, many are in shallow marine water, like this spider crab. But crabs can be found at the deepest part of the ocean in the deep sea vents where there's uh, hot gases coming out from the bottom, uh, supporting a special, really unique community, including some very special crabs. This one was discovered just, you know, pretty recently with hairy claws. They named it a Yeti crab. Um, and then this one is a more typical brachyurine. This, this yeti crab is an anamurine, and uh, this more typical looking crab is a brachyurine. So that's in the deep sea vents. Crabs are also found in freshwater, but that's in Asia and Europe, not in the U.S. <clears throat> we also find uh, crabs in, in intertidal rocks, such as this Sally Lightfoot mostly above water, uh, and then we have crabs in muddy environments, intertidal, uh, such as these uh, ghost crabs and marsh crabs living on mud flats and sandy beaches. We also have crabs out on land. As you know, there are land hermit crabs. I know you have know a lot more about them than I do. And there are land crabs that are brachyurids. Uh, primarily in subtropical and tropical region. And even there are some crabs that live up in trees. Uh, um, a mangrove crab lives up in mangrove trees. Uh, in tidal marshes, uh, fiddler crabs are very visible at low tide. Uh, they're one of my favorites. Their burrows had always been thought to aerate the sediment and be in good for the growth of marsh plants. But it turns out when they are very dense, uh, when the burrows are very close together and very dense, it uh, enables the marsh to erode more easily. So on the whole, with the very dense populations is not good. On the other hand, uh, this crab, this is called a marsh crab, um, they eat the marsh grasses and they can denude uh, large areas of the marsh when they are super abundant. They can cause areas of the marsh to be, uh, to die back because of their eating of the, um, <clears throat> the, the grasses. Uh, <clears throat> turning now to the life cycle of crabs, we start off with courtship. Here's an example of fiddler crab courtship. Uh, the burrow is here, the male is out here with his enlarged claw, and he waves his claw in a particular pattern. Uh, different species wave it different ways, uh, and this is to attract the female to come to his burrow where they will mate. This is a pre-mating uh, courtship behavior in blue crabs where the male is sheltering the female. The female is here, the male is here. He's holding on to her and protecting her as she is preparing to molt. We'll talk about molting shortly. Uh, and as soon after she molts, they will then mate. So he is holding on to her, protecting her while she molts. Um, after molting, the crabs now, this isn't blue crabs anymore, but this is another, this is a different kind of crab. Uh, they mate, and this is the actual mating, uh, the male on top, the female underneath. Uh, so that's the mating. 
And then after that, the female will lay eggs, which will incubate under her abdomen. So here's an upside down female crab with a bunch of eggs uh, under the abdomen that's being pulled back to show you. The eggs take various times to develop, and uh, when they're ready to hatch, they hatch out into very tiny plankton, uh, planktonic zolia larvae, which will undergo uh, some growth and differentiation and, and molting. And after a certain number of molts, they turn into this, which is a megalopa larva. And you can see this larva is beginning to look more like a crab, except it's got the abdomen sticking back here. And after one final molt, it turns into a juvenile. So that's the metamorphosis of the megalopa into the juvenile crab. And that's a critical stage. In order for this to happen properly, uh, it must find the correct type of bottom environment in which to uh, do that final metamorph, that metamorphic molt. Now we've been talking about molting. Let's talk a little bit more about it. Uh, crustaceans with a hard outer shell have to shed it in order to grow. So during the life of a crustacean, it undergoes many, many molts. And um, the molting process starts long before the actual molt. The preliminaries called proecdysis is the preparation. And in order to prepare, they have to soften that old shell. So they will dissolve away the calcium. Uh, this is all done by an epithelial layer of, of living tissue right underneath the hard shell. They dissolve the old shell, store the calcium internally so they can use it later, and they lay down the rudiment of the new shell underneath the uh, thinning old shell. When this is complete, they do the actual molt, which is the ecdysis. And the old shell will split along, along the back of the animal. We have a picture coming in a minute. Splits along the back of the animal, and they have to pull out everything, all every appendages, their eye stalks, the uh, bristles, the uh, lining of the mouth. All of this gets pulled away so the animal can separate itself from the old shell. Uh, it's difficult, and sometimes a leg or something gets left behind. Uh, it, 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 it sometimes crabs can't do it and they'll die. So this is a really hazardous process that uh, crustaceans have to do many times in their life. Uh, following that, they've, they've come out, they're very soft. And it takes uh, several days to a week or so to harden the new shell, get the calcium back into it. And they have to ex swell up a bit to expand the new shell to make room for new growth. During this time when they're soft, they're very vulnerable and they tend to hide away until the new shell is hard or else they're very vulnerable to predators. And as I said, this happens over and over again. Okay, here's some pictures. You see here this crab, the lighter colored stuff is the old shell and this darker stuff is the news, the crab itself pulling out, backing out of its old shell. And here we have a little further along, here's the, the top of the old shell, the bottom of the old shell, and here's the soft crab pulling out. And by here, the crab is pretty much all pulled out. And this is the empty hollow old shell left behind. Uh, another example with a different kind of crab. Here's your soft crab beginning to pull out from the old shell. It's a little further along. A little further along. Here's your old empty shell. And it's about done, out. And now it's finished. So a very difficult, hazardous process that they do over and over and over again through their life.
Okay, now here's a question. Since the zoea larvae and megalopa are aquatic, they have to be in water. But we have a number of species of crabs that live on land. So the problem is how do they breed? And the answer is they have to migrate down to the water in order to lay the, to, to release their larvae. They breed on land, but it's a matter of releasing the larvae into the water. And here's just an example of a mass migration of some tropical uh, land crabs down to the ocean all together in, in a mass in uh, some tropical islands. And uh, this is a spectacular, spectacular event. And if they have to cross a road, there's carnage of many crabs getting run over if it's a busy road. Uh, the process then occurs in reverse sometime later, a few months later, when the juvenile, when the megalope have uh, turned into juvenile crabs, they make the same migration back, going back to the forest or wherever they were living. Parental care is extremely rare. Before I wrote this book and did the research, I had no idea there was any crab that had any parental care. But here is one a crab called a bromeliad crab that lives in plants called bromeliads that are up in trees. And the, the, the anatomy of this plant is such that rainwater can get uh, trapped and they have puddles of rainwater inside the bromeliad plant. And um, the eggs, the bromeliad crab lays her eggs in this puddle of water in the plant and the juveniles and larvae live and the uh, female crab tends the nest. She brings the babies food, insects, and cleans the tritus and stuff out of the nest. So here among all the crabs in the world, there's only one, I guess we should say, one that we know of that has any parental care. Then a bit that you all probably know very well, better than I, that hermit crabs as they grow must need a good fitting snail shell. So they have to change shells as they grow. And fitting right is very important. If it's too big, it's very heavy to carry around. If it's too small, the animal can't withdraw right enough into its shell. So fitting right is, is important. And finding a new shell periodically is one of the most important events of a hermit crab's life. And that happens several times during its life. It tries out new shells for fit. Uh, they frequently fight over shells, uh, and sometimes one will actually try to evict a crab, another crab from a shell that it wants. Um, but there's also been found as in some crab, uh, hermits a situation called shell exchanges where a, there's an empty, fairly large shell and, and a uh, a fairly large crab in a smaller shell goes for that one and that it empties out that one's shell and the next larger one moves into that shell and so forth. They call this is a, a shell exchange. So fighting isn't always the case, but frequently. Okay, talking a bit about problems that crabs have <clears throat> and pollution caused by people is one of them. Uh, talk about several different examples here. We have up here uh, oil pollution in a marsh. Fiddler crabs dig burrows. And the burrows just indicated here schematically in this marsh. Now, when there's oil pollution, it sinks down eventually from the surface. And you can have a, a huge pool of oil down below the surface of the marsh. And the crabs will not be able to burrow and don't want to burrow into the oil. So they end up with much shorter burrows. And uh, this can be fatal because in wintertime, in, uh, in, in the mid-Atlantic or New England area, the marsh freezes in winter. And if you were down here, you would be below the freezing line. But if you're in such a shallow burrow, uh, you could freeze to death, and this has happened uh, in areas of oil spills. 
A second type of pollution that can uh, be harmful to crabs is a probably the most common type of pollution in the world. We call eutrophication or excess nutrients. This is caused by sewage coming in or perhaps uh, runoff from agricultural areas or uh, from uh, lawns with fertilizers. And the fertilizer effect of the sewage or fertilizer stimulates a bloom of single-celled algae, phytoplankton. And, and that's all fine for a while, but the bloom can't last forever and it will die and the individual plankton cells then sink to the bottom and they get decayed. The decay process done by bacteria uses up the oxygen in the water. So you end up with very low oxygen, we call hypoxia, down near the bottom. And uh, animals that are on the bottom that can't swim away rapidly, such as uh, sea stars, crabs, lobsters, may die from lack of oxygen. Another type of pollution is uh, toxic chemicals. Uh, they will, when there's toxic chemicals like mercury, PCBs, pesticides, and so forth, uh, that uh, are in the water or in the sediments get into the animal. They cause the changes in physiology, behavior, biochemistry, all sorts of changes. But they also can accumulate in the animal, making them unfit to eat. So you have signs like this, uh, which was in Newark Bay, where there was uh, a lot of dioxin. And so the crabs were unfit to eat. And in some ways, this was good for the crabs because the crab populations grow when people are not catching them. Uh, another kind of pollution is litter, plastic litter, which we have a lot of concern about, does a whole lot of harm uh, to many marine animals. Uh, some hermit crabs have managed to make use of it. Uh, you see uh, some areas, if shells, if snail shells are not abundant, they may make use of, of bottle tops and small things like that to live in. So uh, taking advantage of what's there. Uh, back to hypoxia, blue crabs may swarm in large numbers into very shallow water or even out of the water uh, when there's very low oxygen. And uh, for some reason, people call this a jubilee. I guess it's a jubilee because for people to catch the blue crabs, it's a very happy experience. It's obviously not a happy experience for the blue crabs. Okay, that's about problems of crabs. This slide is about problem crabs, crabs that can cause problems for uh, other members of the community where they live. Uh, there are some crabs that uh, can be considered parasites. Um, here is a pea crab living inside a mussel shell. Uh, pea crabs in general live inside bivalve mollusks like mussels, crabs, uh, mussels and clams and oysters and so forth. Uh, in some cases, they don't do any harm. They're just living there and you know, feeding on the some of the plankton that the uh, shellfish is eating. Uh, in other cases, they do do harm, in which case they're called a parasite. So there's a kind of a thin line here between what's a really a parasite and what's a commensal. A commensal means it's not harming the host. So um, a thin gray area between them. <clears throat> and then there are a number of crabs who are invasive. Now an invasive species is a one that is not native and that does harm in the new environment. And in, this, in, in the US, we have three that we'll mention here. This is the Chinese mitten crab called because the claws are very hairy. Uh, that has been invading in California and undermining some of the, the marshes 
uh, there. Uh, and then we have the green crab, which we'll talk about a little bit more uh, in the next slide. Uh, and then the Asian shore crab, which is a more recent arrival within the past couple of decades. Now here's about the green crab. Uh, it's native to Europe here in blue, and it's invaded all these areas shown in green or red. The red, I think, are the newest invasions. Uh, it's been here on the East Coast quite a while, uh, but more recently moved further north into New England. And then it also recently, uh, more recently arrived to the West Coast and South Africa and Australia. <clears throat> so it's, it's pretty much a worldwide invader. The problem is that it's a very, very good predator on bivalves, on clams and mussels and oysters. It outcompetes other kinds of crabs for this food. And uh, it is suspected that it caused a population collapse of, uh, of softshell clams in Maine when it arrived there within a past few decades. And it also seems to have negative effects because of outcompeting Dungeness crabs in the Pacific. Uh, one thing that makes them a, a good invader is that they are not fussy about where they live. They can live in mud flats or rocky areas or areas full of algae. So they have multiple kinds of habitats, which makes which is good for them and not good for everything else. Uh, Hollywood has also uh, dealt with problem crabs. Uh, this is a you know an old horror movie from the 50s, uh, and I just point out the anatomical absurdity of this picture with the eyes here and a mouthful of teeth. I find this a very funny poster. Um, it's a kind of horror movie you would laugh at. Okay, now talking about um, positive interactions of crabs with other kinds of, uh, of marine animals. And we see there are many different kind of marine animals that crabs associate with. And uh, this slide is about cnidarians. Cnidarians are the phylum with jellyfish and coral and sea anemones and so forth. So we have here this crab named Trapezius. You see it with its claws. It's a kind of a front view with the claws out on either side uh, that lives in coral. And then we have porcelain crab here that lives in anemone. This is the tentacles of an anemone. You know about Nemo, uh, clownfish that lives in anemone, but there's this crab that also, porcelain crabs that also live in anemones. And then this picture here is a boxer crab. It has, a, it's a very small crab and it has an anemone on each claw. And uh, this is useful for, it gives the anemone mobility, and anemone is an attached animal that is in one place, but when living on a crab, it gets to go around, it gets mobility, and can catch plankton in new places. For the crab, this crab has very weak claws. It's a small crab with little claws, not good for catching food, but the anemones do the catching of food for the crab, so they both benefit. Then we have, and then we also have anemones over the shell of some various species of hermit crabs also. And finally, we have a group of crabs called carrier crabs that put other things on top of them. And, and the other things may in fact be an upside down jellyfish in this example. We'll see other examples of carrier crabs uh, later. Okay, crabs can also associate with plants or algae. There is a floating algae called sargassum that floats around in the Sargasso Sea in the Gulf Stream. 
and uh, has a whole community of animals that you are uniquely associated with it, including this little crab called the sargassum crab. Uh, and you see its color is very closely matches the color of the sargassum weed. And oops, that wasn't supposed, well, I can't go back. Uh, the other things were uh, decorator crabs that put uh, seaweed on top of their carapace and, and make themselves very well camouflaged by having uh, the seaweed on them. There's also a kelp crab that uh, lives among kelp and is exactly the same color. Looking some more at relations with, with sea urchins in this case, here is a large carrier crab, same kind of crab that had the jellyfish on top of it. This one had, can, is carrying a sea urchin, which is certainly very good protection. Sea urchins with the sharp spines are a very good protection to have if you're walking along. And then we have a very tiny crab that lives, here's your sea urchin, and this tiny crab, urchin crab, living among those spines. So whether you're carrying it on your back if you're a big crab, or you're living among the spines if you're a tiny crab, you're well protected by the spines of the sea urchin. Uh, so we have camouflage, and uh, other protective device, you know, uh, protect ways of protecting itself against predators. There are other kinds of strategies for protecting against predators. Uh, one here for fiddler crabs and other burrowing crabs is to hide in the burrows. Uh, if you go to a, an area with a colony of fiddler crabs and you come close, they're all duck in their burrows uh, very fast. Then we have these guys here who are spreading out their claws. This is a defensive posture. It's a threat posture. And if you're not really tough, that could deter you, the sharp claws sticking out toward you. If something should grab the crab by the, by the claw, let's say a seagull or some other bird, grabs the crab by the claw and starts to fly away with it, they are able to detach their claw, a process called autotomy, where they can, uh, on purpose, break off their claw. And you may see a claw uh, that came off of a crab. You may see that on the beach sometimes. Um, so the crab gets away, and the predator is left with only one claw. Uh, after doing that, the crab can regenerate. Crabs can regenerate all their legs. Uh, so it, losing the claw doesn't mean you're permanently with only one claw. Another anti-predator strategy is safety in numbers. This is a large number called a pod of uh, king crabs at a certain stage in their life cycle, juveniles. Of course, all those anti-predator behaviors and techniques are not always successful. Uh, crabs do get eaten. They get eaten by birds, get eaten by octopuses, they get eaten by fish, sea otters, crocodiles, and so forth. So uh, crabs do get eaten despite shell and claws. And people also eat crabs. And uh, that takes us to a discussion about crab fisheries. The main way crabs are caught in the crab fishery is by traps that are called lobster pots or crab pots. Uh, some of the important crab fisheries in the world are the Alaskan king crab and tanner crabs. The king crab and tanner crab fisheries were uh, discussed in a TV program called The Deadliest Catch. The boat, the fishing boats are going out in, you know, freezing, stormy weather in Alaska. It's a very dangerous profession to be a crab fisherman. But here's a, a look at the king crab. And if you look, it looks like it has only four legs because this is an anamurin. 
and the fifth leg is tiny. Here's catching them and so forth. Uh, so this is the king crab. Mostly what's eaten is the large legs. This is a tanner crab. This is a brachyurin crab, five appendages on each side. Dungeness crabs are very um, important fishery in the West Coast, in, in the Pacific Northwest. And um, seeing different aspects of the Dungeness crab fishery, you could have certain size, minimum size that's legal to take. And here we've got jumbo ready to eat Dungeness crabs. The uh, fishery sort of fluctuates up and down, but it's basically a pretty healthy fishery. Then in Florida and in the Gulf of Mexico, we have a crab called the stone crab shown here. Uh, there's all, most of the meat, as in most any crab, is in the claws. And here the claws are really big and the rest of the animal is hardly worth, worth bothering with. So instead of killing the whole crab, they autonomize the claw. They take off one claw from the crab and then release the crab back to the water because it will regenerate. So this is a truly harvesting approach, this fishery, where uh, only one crab, one claw is taken from each crab that is caught. And here they are, here are the claws, and here they are on your dinner plate. Uh, we use the word harvesting to talk about taking uh, animals out of the ocean for eating, but harvesting, I think of like taking apples off a tree and not taking the whole tree. And this is the crab fishery that is really harvesting. Uh, on the Atlantic coast, the blue crab is the major fishery, uh, most concentrated around Chesapeake Bay. Here's a catch of blue crabs. Also popular uh, is if you get a crab that's in the process of molting, or you can tell ahead of time, there are techniques to know if a crab is going to be molting within a week or so, you save them and wait until they molt, keep them in water and, and, and maintain them until they molt, and then you will have a soft shell crab, which is very valuable. Uh, people like to eat soft shell crabs here, uh, which is a way of eating crabs without all the fuss and bother. Um, it's very interesting, uh, the, the fishery for the blue crabs was, was depressed through the early, through the late 90s and the early 2000s. Uh, and then there was, there had been a fishery going in the winter, which caught largely female crabs, which is not a very good way if you want to have a sustainable fishery to take the females that are incubating eggs in the winter. When the Virginia closed that fishery, up went the population of blue crabs. Some problems from this fishery are uh, lost crab pots. They call them derelict crab pots or ghost fishing, uh, where the, <clears throat> the owner can't find the crab pot. Crab pots, you know, blown away somewhere else. It's in the water. It's still catching things. Nobody can empty it. And all the things that are going into it can't get out and are going to and die. So it's a very wasteful, very sad thing. Uh, and there, there have been uh, occasional efforts to uh, find and, and retrieve these lost crab pots. Okay, eating crabs. Uh, different ways of eating crabs. First is eating the whole crab. You have, you know, you wear a bib, you have a hammer, you get really messy trying to crack the shell, get the, get the meat out, and uh, you can't really be um, very involved in good manners if you're going to eat crabs this way. It's fun, but it's hard work. Uh, if you have other people do the work for you, you can get crab cakes which in Baltimore are terrific. It's mostly crab with a little bit of breadcrumbs. 
Elsewhere, I have sometimes had crab cakes that were mostly breadcrumbs with a little bit of crab, and I wasn't anywhere near as happy. Then there is a specialty in South Carolina called she crab soup, which includes um, eggs uh, of the uh, female eggs. Um, so it's called she crab, the female uh, soup. It's very good. And then there is the soft shell crab, where uh, they will hold the, a crab in that will soon molt. Uh, they hold it till it molts, and and then they um, they take the freshly malted soft shell crab, and that's easy eating too. Then there is this called surimi or fake crab. It's really fish, pollock or hake fish with some crab flavoring, and uh, they taste pretty much like a crab. Not bad. They're a lot cheaper too. Uh, in terms of crab relations with human beings, crabs are kind of important in popular culture. We see t-shirts. I have a t-shirt with a hermit crab. I have another t-shirt with a blue crab. So they're, they're on t-shirts. They're in children's books. They're here, Fisherman's Wharf, big statue of a crab. Uh, this is a mosaic on the floor of the Monaco Aquarium. Uh, we also have the character in The Little Mermaid, Sebastian the Crab, who sings Under the Sea. Uh, I think Sebastian's an anamurin looking at his, uh, his anatomy. He looks like an anamurin to me. And then we have uh, hobbies. Well, I forgot astrology. We've got a car, Cancer the Crab up in the sky. And then to hobbies, we have land hermit crabs. And I'm not going to tell you about that. You know a whole lot more about that than I do. But this is a popular hobby, and perhaps some people are doing it in such a serious way that the word hobby is an insult. Some people, is, this is their life. Then there's recreational crabbing. It's a popular, popular thing. Put something, dunk it in the water. The something you put on your line is frequently a chicken neck, and we've got bumper stickers, proud to be a chicken necker, and people enjoy it. That's a very popular uh, creation. And uh, the, the other thing you missed was a picture of someone whose crab was biting her leg. Uh, Finally, we have crab festivals all over the country. Uh, we see here crab festivals for blue crabs, soft shell crabs, dungeness crabs. People have whole festivals about crabs. And um, since we love crabs so much, we need to conserve them for the future. And I'm done. Thank you very much.